Gemar Khatima Tova. We're even out of practice and we still sounded so good. Look at us. Out of practice because we haven't seen each other in person, that's all. I begin my remarks this evening with the story of an unknown source. Yeah, I see people, you can put your books down, that's okay, you can get comfortable. I just like to make sure everyone's comfortable. This is another story, strangely, of the beginning of creation and with angels and human beings, and it wasn't planned, I promise. From I spoke about that on Rosh Hashanah day one, for those who saw that. The story goes like this. When God was ready to create human beings on the sixth day of creation, God decided to give human beings a special gift. They would each get, or this one first human, would get, and future humans, nitzatzot, holy sparks of God's goodness. Now the angels heard about this and they became very jealous and angry. They didn't want human beings to have a special gift that they didn't have. So God heard their complaints and unhappiness and thought it over. Finally, God said to the kvetching angels, I'll make a deal with you. I will still give the human beings these holy sparks, but you get to pick the place where I will hide them. So all the angels had a big meeting to decide where to put the sparks. One angel suggested, let's put the sparks at the top of Mount Everest. They surely cannot get it there. But another angel replied to that, no, 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 this human being is going to be strong and it's going to have perseverance. They're going to eventually find a way to get it on Mount Everest. Okay, so another angel spoke up. But what if we drop the divine sparks at the bottom of the ocean? Human beings aren't fish. They can't just hold their breath long enough to get the sparks down of the ocean. So another angel had a counterpart argument, had a counterpoint. But human beings are going to have intelligence. And surely at some point they'll find out how to build a machine that will enable them to travel underwater. The bottom of the ocean is not far enough away to hide the sparks. Now the angels were getting really frustrated. They rejected the idea of putting the sparks in the forest or burying them in the sand. They, they just didn't know what to do. Finally, one angel spoke up in a quiet voice. She said, I have a better idea. Let's ask God to hide the divine sparks of goodness inside each human being. They will never, ever think to look there. <laughs> Finally, a proposal that all the angels could agree with. And so it came to pass. I absolutely love this story. It so perfectly reveals a deeply human truth. We rarely see, truly see, the divine sparks in others and in ourselves. When we move past one another without acknowledgement or interaction, which is exacerbated by the fact that we might not even be looking up from our phones these days, we contribute to a culture in which people aren't seen, where they're dehumanized. It might seem inconsequential, but we have to ask, where does it lead? When we react with unkindness, when a service provider of some kind doesn't get us what we need, are we furthering feelings of shame and unworthiness in them? What's the ripple effect when we do not award dignity to another? And what are those effects when we don't see the sparks in ourselves? 
when we bend towards perfectionism and measure ourselves by an unattainable standard, we miss out on opportunities to experience satisfaction, to feel joy, and to offer those things out into the world. When we blame ourselves for things that go wrong around us, including things for which we have little or no control, we do it all the time. I've seen people blame themselves for plane delays. <laughs> when we do that, we make the problem about us instead of focusing on what we need to do to fix, to mend, or repair. And feelings of unworthiness and not being good enough that we all have, at least from time to time, and some of us more of the time, can lead to apathy. When confronted with a, need, a world in need of repair, we might doubt that we have anything meaningful to contribute, so we might give up altogether. What would happen if we changed our ways? If we could reorient the way we see ourselves and others at least more of the time, on this night of transformations, I want to challenge each and every one of us to go digging for the sparks, to actively seek out and uplift the divinity in ourselves and others as an act of teshuva, an act of returning to who we are and are meant to be, and an act of turning towards others and the world. And to that end, I'm going to offer two teachings that might help us find those hidden sparks. And because this is all more easily said than done, I'm going to also offer practices, tools from these teachings that we might utilize over the next 24 hours or for the rest of our lives. So the first teaching is, Bishvili nivraha olam, the world was created for me. In Mishnah Sanhedrin, our ancient rabbis discuss the implications of the Jewish creation story, the idea that all of humanity derives from a single human being, Adam. And we should note that at this point in the story, Adam is multi-gendered includes everyone and all, both, many genders. In one section of this Mishnah, the rabbis marvel at the diversity of humankind, saying that this is a sign of God's greatness. And then the rabbis instruct, kol echad be'echad chayav lomar, Therefore, because each of us is unique, because each of us is different, each person is obligated to say, the world was created for me. Me? Little old me? Well, also you and you and you and all of you, but you have to say that for yourselves. Quite astonishingly, the rabbis use the language of chayav, of obligation. It's the same language that is used for mitzvot, for commanded acts. According to the rabbis, this is not an optional teaching. We must find a way to acknowledge that we have something utterly unique to bring to the world and that the world needs what we have to bring. Now, some of you may be wondering, aren't we supposed to be humble? After all, wasn't Moses the lead character of the Torah the most humble of all? And shouldn't we emulate this quality, especially on Yom Kippur, a day where we should be contrite and apologetic? And to this, I'm going to answer in a very Jewish way and say, it depends. <laughs> it depends on your definition of humility. The Oxford Dictionary defines humility as, quote, a modest or low view of one's importance. 
Yet there is a school of Jewish thought, the Musar, self-improvement tradition, that defines the Hebrew word anava, humility, in quite the opposite manner. In their view, anava, humility, is a healthy and appropriate sense of ourselves and our worth. Not too much, but not too little. Rabbi Shlomo Wolby, a prolific Musar teacher of the 20th century, points to the Torah heroes as models of this kind of humility. He says that Abraham said that Abraham was dust and ashes, yet Abraham had the chutzpah to petition God to, forget, to, to uh, save Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses was the most humble, yet on numerous occasions, he demanded that God have compassion and redeem the Israelites. Wolby says, the humility of these great individuals did not cause them to disregard their positive qualities, rather to capitalize on them for the sake of others. What a revolutionary teaching. To be humble in this view means that we have to know our basic self-worth. And this is key, that that awareness is what enables us to be righteous. It's what enables us to serve. In fact, Wolby warns, if one's humility inhibits one's sense of service to the world, then that person has stepped over the parameters of humility. Bishvili nivra ha'olam. Know your worth. Know your strengths. Use them for the good of others. Now, it's one thing for us to know this intellectually, but another thing, as I said before, to live it. And in that spirit, I want to invite you to practice this idea over the holiday of Yom Kippur, especially when feelings of self-doubt and unworthiness inevitably creep in. And the practice is simple. Say the phrase, the world was created for me. After all, the rabbis of the Mishnah knew better not to instruct us to believe this. They said, Chayav Lomar. Chayav Lomar. We are obligated to say it. We are obligated to say it. So for the sake of practice right now, I'm going to ask you to indulge me to say it together. First, I'll say it, and then you're going to join me. It's okay. If you, you don't have to, but it's an invitation. The world was created for me. The world was created for me. Bishvili nivra ha'olam. Bishvili nivra ha'olam. Perhaps if we say it enough, we'll come to believe it. Or more importantly, if we say it enough, we might lift up the holy hidden sparks for the sake of others and for the sake of the world. Second teaching, searching for the good points. A story is told of Rebbe Nachman of Bretzlaff, the great 18th century Hasidic master. A man came to him looking exhausted, emotionally and physically, his eyes tired with tears. He explained to the Rebbe that he was in distress because he was a terrible person with no mitzvot, no good deeds to speak of. Rabbi Nachman waited until the man had said everything on his mind. He took a deep breath and then he said, well, if that's the case, then I have no one to talk to because you're already completely bad, too far gone. When the man heard this, he straightened up a little bit in his seat. Well, sometimes... Sometimes I guess I was okay. <laughs> Sometimes I was kind. To, the rep, to this, the Rebbe said, that is the start. And with that, the man felt relieved and revitalized. He began to see that he had good points after all. This story is especially poignant because it is likely that Rabbi Nachman himself saw a mirror when he talked to that man. Rebbe Nachman was known for his inner turmoil, his struggle, his spiritual doubts. He often could not see the sparks in himself. 
and he developed spiritual practices to address and combat the forces that tear us down and cause us to sink into depression or despair. One of these practices is quite literally a digging for the sparks, or in his word, searching for nikudot tovot, good points in ourselves and others. His teaching begins, you have to judge everyone favorably. We could stop here and just spend the rest of Yom Kippur focused on that one line, but I'll keep going. You have to judge everyone favorably. Even if you have reason to think Plony is completely wicked, that person is completely wicked, it is imperative to seek out some of their goodness. And when you find that bit of goodness and you judge that person from that perspective, you actually raise them up in goodness. Treating people this way allows them to be restored into shuva. There is so much to say about this passage, but I want to just focus for a second on this idea that when we think of people in a positive light, we potentially contribute to their growth. We see them as they want to be seen, as they want to grow, and they might begin to inhabit that. I've seen this with my own children. When I actually treat them as capable, independent people who can think and act for themselves, the more that they act in that light. Now imagine if we apply this teaching on a more regular basis. How much suffering would end and isolation would be diminished? How much goodness and peace would come if we were truly to see people in that light? Now comes the hard part. Rabbi Nachman then says, now go digging to find the good points in yourself. He warns, watch out for old man gloom, who's going to push you down and trick you into thinking you did nothing right, you did nothing good. But it is true, you must have done something good for someone at some time. Now go look for it. And when you find that little bit of good, you have to search more and keep going. Even if your motivations are imperfect, even if your actions are imperfect, keep going. Keep looking to see the good. I find this teaching helpful, especially on Yom Kippur, a time where we literally beat our chest to symbolize regret and remorse for actions and inactions. Recognizing our good points helps us see the difference between our actions and our existential character. Even though we've missed the mark, sometimes been cruel, acted selfishly, spoken badly about others, we, those are actions we need to rectify, but they are not all of who we are. We can feel guilt, but we don't have to feel shame. In fact, seeing the good things draws us more into shuva because we begin to see our own potential and aim to grow in that direction. For Rebbe Nachman, this was not just a philosophy. This was a daily spiritual practice. So, again, asking you to practice with me for a little bit this evening. Let's give ourselves a minute to try it. And hopefully it is something we can bring with us the rest of Yom Kippur or perhaps other days of the year or every day. So if you're willing, make sure you're sitting comfortably. Close your eyes. Think of a person that you know who you find a little challenging to get along with. And I want to make sure it's a little and not a lot. You don't want to start at the advanced belt, right? <laughs> bring them to mind. Think about something good that this person does in the world, even if it doesn't impact you directly. Think about a quality this person embodies. What do they contribute to our community or your community? Now let's turn to ourselves. 
Some of you already may be having an aversion to turning towards yourself. Old man gloom, as Rabbi Nachman says, is coming for us. But just look for one thing, one thing. And if that comes fast to you, just then go on to the next, and then the next. Or just stay with one if it's hard. This is a practice of digging for the sparks, one good quality or action at a time. The practice that we just experienced is known as Azam Ra, which means I will sing. Rebbe Nachman taught that each nikuda, each good point, is a musical note. And when we find the good points, and then the next good point, and then the next good point, and we string them together, they are like notes that create a song. A song that only we individually can sing. A song that is unique to us. It follows then that if, we if each of us were to string melodies made up of our good points, then together, each of us singing becomes a symphony. And in the process of creating the symphony, we also lift each other up. We lift up the good points to find renewed joy and possibility. So let's sing. We're going to sing to dig for and raise up holy sparks. The melody that we are going to sing is one that's new to you and most of the world. It's a new composition written by Josh Warshawski. And the words are also from Rebbe Nachman from a different section in his teaching. And the words say, go like this. Every person must say to himself or herself, the world was created for me. That's familiar already. Once I realize the world was created for me, I must at all times be searching for ways to do tikkun olam, to fill the holes in the world, and to pray on her behalf. So I want to invite you to find your smaller supplement, A13. And I want to acknowledge that this is a new song for us. It might take us a minute just to get used to the melody, to listen, get used to the words. But in the spirit of Azamra, I invite you to participate either with words or Lila Lies and to imagine that you are stringing together with each note your good parts and that as you join with the voices of your neighbor, you are lifting up the goodness of each person here and also the people at home on Zoom and maybe also even all the people in synagogues across the world right now, combining our voices, lifting the sparks helping us in the process of teshuva, of turning and returning. Ki tsarich A13. A13 in the addendum. Oh, A4. I have good points. I can make mistakes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> A for Azamra. Thank you. 
We continue raising our voices.